Yeah, it's got something to do with what I do. Um, just to start off, sir. I don't to... use your name. I just answer it. Yes. Okay. And I keep looking at you, and I don't look here. You don't want me to look here. You want me to look at you. I don't use your name, and I just answer whatever you talk about. And so the narrator then on the film will do something, and my and my answer will fit in. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a plan. Um, just to really start off, when I say the word flight or flying, what does it mean to you? Does it evoke an emotion? Is it state of being? What is flight? Uh, with my background, is almost a technical answer. I would think uh, about. What do I mean? You know, off the earth, moving around. I would think of birds. I would think of airplanes, uh, that sort of thing. I wouldn't connect it emotionally with myself at all. That's almost, uh, to me, with my engineering background. I was an aeronautical engineer at the University of Texas, which I took, incidentally, so that I could become a better pilot. That was always my dream from the time I was small. So flight then doesn't really connect emotionally to me. So while you were at the University of Texas, you went through ROTC, maybe ROTC, but why did you choose the Navy rather than some of the other services? We were speaking with Gene Cernan yesterday where he was talking about how you know, he, was, he always wanted to do Navy, but you know, some of the other services were flying at the same time. You had your you had Air Force and the, and the Army. Sure. So why did you choose the Navy? Uh, I uh, uh, have wanted to be a pilot since I was a small boy, 10 or so. I grew up in World War II, so I saw them in the movies and I wanted to be a pilot, but I didn't know whether the Air Force or Army or whatever it was, or Navy, but as I got a little bit older, I began to hear that Navy pilots were better because they had to land on aircraft carriers. That appealed to me, and so I said, I want to be a Navy pilot because I want to be the best pilot I can be. I found out later that Navy pilots are good. Uh, Air Force pilots are just as good. Marine pilots are just as good. Uh, some are better than others, just like everything else, every other profession. But we get trained to land, uh, land on carriers, which is very difficult, very difficult. But you could take Air Force guys and do the same thing, train them to do it, and they'd do it just as well as I did or better. So it was more following a myth, and I was glad I did because uh, uh, it, I, I just, uh, the, Navy is, uh, the Navy is a special place, an armed service, special armed service relative now to the Marines or the Air Force or the Army, in my opinion. Um, so after you got commissioned and everything, what was Navy life like for you? Well, I'd been dreaming about it for a long time and I went to the University of Texas on an NROTC scholarship. So uh, we had summer cruises and so we got introduced to the Navy sort of that way over those four years uh, that I was at the University of Texas. So going away to the Navy wasn't all that strange, you know. Uh, I fit right in and I was going to flight training. And so at flight training, they're telling you what to do. Uh, you have a regimen, you have a syllabus. You, I was in pre-flight school, you know. So it wasn't that much different than what I'd been doing before. So it gradually transitioned me in to uh, Navy life. One of the nice things about the military, particularly the Navy, which I know most about, is they train you to do what they want you to do. I've noticed in the outside world, often they'll hire somebody, they'll want him to be a marketing manager, but they don't give him any training as marketing manager of that company. They say, well, he come in and learn that. But the Navy, when they want you to fly, they train you to fly a Navy way. I think that's a wonderful thing to do because that way when you're called on to do a job in the Navy, they've told you how to do it. And then you can go do it and learn to do it even better and that sort of thing. But still, 
Then when you're promoted and you go, like I went to test pilot school, they sent me to school for nine months teaching me how to be a test pilot. They didn't just say, well, this guy's a good pilot, he'll figure it out. They, they guide you along. It, it's wonderful. Could you talk just briefly about the, the teamwork and the camaraderie that, that you had while, during your time in the Navy? Well, it's, it's uh, the teamwork and camaraderie in the Navy is different from any place I experienced before. I can remember going to the squadron there and being surrounded by people that wanted to fly airplanes. I was never in that situation ever before. Certainly in high school and college, people were going to do all these other things and kind of looked at you strange if you wanted to be a military pilot. You know, what would you want to go do that for? You know, that's dangerous. And, why would you do that? But I always wanted to. And so here's all these other guys in the squadron. They want to do it too. We're all trying to do it. And we're not competing except in performance, whether we could bomb better than the other guy or uh, shoot bullets better. You know, all these skills land on the carrier better. You're all are doing that, but together you're not trying to over, you know, get that guy's job over there. Because in the Navy, you don't do that. I came in as an ensign. I was the lowest rank in the squadron. Uh, that's good. I didn't feel different. Um, Lieutenant JGs weren't trying to take over the skipper's job. Or, and in companies outside the military, there's a lot of competition to bring down the guy ahead of you so that you can take his place in the same way on. Uh, it doesn't make you exactly have good camaraderie. It makes you play like you've got good camaraderie, but really, if you're ambitious, you don't have any of it. So it's different, and I like that environment much better. I don't like to try to find a way to climb over anybody. I want to work with people as a team member and try to be as great as I can be and try to help them be as great as they can be. That's the way I like to live my life. So you've had countless hours behind, behind the stick on a number of different aircraft. Could you talk briefly about the, some of the aircraft that you have flown, uh, both as an aviator and then as a test pilot, and maybe say something that would be, that's memorable that you'd want younger generations to know about. Well, I can remember uh, graduating from uh, flight training, getting my gold wings, and had my mother pin them on. And I wanted to be a fighter pilot in the best, fastest airplane the Navy had, which was F 8U Crusader. Okay? I'd look at it I when it landed at a field near me or something. That, boy, that's the plane I want to fly. And then when I got assigned, I was assigned in training as an attack jet. Go oh, stop and let that go by. And I'll pick up back. <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, we'll, yeah. okay. Um, well, let me back up and think how, where I, what I was saying. Um, uh, when I graduated from flight training, got my gold wings and my mother pinned on. That was a very happy day. Uh, I can remember uh, thinking, you know, I uh, hope they assign me to uh, uh, F-8U squadron, fighter squadron, because that is the fastest, best airplane in the Navy. Well, it didn't happen that way. They assigned me to a jet attack squadron flying F-9, F-8s, Cougars. Well, that's a nice airplane, but it was, you know, one of the older airplanes, and so I was just glad to go, but I was a little disappointed. And so I went to the squadron. I learned to fly F-9, F-8s. I learned the attack mission. Uh, what I discovered is I went along and definitely think that now is that was the right place for me to go because that airplane was very forgiving. And when you're a young pilot, you make mistakes. When you're an old pilot, you make mistakes. All humans make mistakes. So really, when you're young and make more of them, you, in my opinion now, uh, 
that's you want to be in the safest airplane around that will do the mission so that you can make these mistakes and, and survive. And I can remember uh, one time we were down at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, doing loft bombing, a sort of bombing, nuclear bomb, where you carry a nuclear bomb and you pull up like this, and then it releases and it goes up high. That allows you to get away, and then and you use little practice bombs. And I can remember making a run one day, and I pulled up like that, and it was late in the day. We had been doing this for maybe three or four weeks straight because we'd go down there for this intensive training. I was based in Jacksonville. We'd fly down there for intensive training. And I don't know why, but I just pulled too tight. I don't, real tight. And I stalled the airplane, and it flipped on me. It went out of control because I'd done this because I was just fatigued and wasn't paying attention. And I flipped out of control and went in a cloud just as I did. And I really didn't know exactly what to do. And that airplane came out of it on its own because that airplane would do that. Crusader wouldn't do that. I'd be dead now from that mistake. And that's just one of the mistakes that I made when I was young. And uh, I remember thinking, you know, I'm glad I'm in this F9, F8. It maybe won't go as fast as a Crusader or some others, but it saved my life right there. Another thing that happened that I've noticed throughout my career, whether I was flying f 9 or something else, if some opportunity unscheduled came up where I was supposed to do something that I wasn't planning to do, like they'd call and want you to make a low pass, or they'd want you to do something that you hadn't practiced or thought about, I can remember getting into trouble several different times like that and thinking, wow, I'm lucky that I didn't get killed because that, I didn't do that right. I tell you, after a couple of those experiences where luck saved me, you got to have a lot of luck in airplanes, luck saved me, then when somebody would come up with something unusual or I'd be in a place where maybe I wanted to show off to my mom and dad because I'd brought the airplane home. <laughs> Man, I, alarm would go off in my head and I'd say, don't do this. This is exactly how people get killed. And uh, that's how I read about it all the time. I think that guy wasn't as lucky as me. I did that dumb thing. He did. I'll pick up again and say uh, frequently I read about in the paper when someone uh, in the military gets killed and it's not infrequently that I can recognize they're in a, we're doing something with their airplane that they really hadn't planned to do that they were making uh, a trip that they hadn't really planned or they were showing off or just something that wasn't uh, the uh, technical um, thing they should be doing. And they weren't as lucky as I was because I was lucky. I, later on, I, it set off an alarm. I didn't do it anymore. <laughs> but these are things you learn as a pilot that, uh, that uh, are important if you want to survive. You got to have luck because a lot of good pilots, better pilots than I am, didn't survive as long as I have because they didn't get as lucky. So uh, I hope good luck for anybody that happens to watch this, uh, this uh, video or this movie. Is this going to be a video? It's actually going to wind up being a half hour show that is solely dedicated to the centennial of naval aviation. Okay. So, uh, from your time behind the stick um, with the Navy and then uh, being a part of NASA, where have you seen aviation go? From its almost from its infancy to where it is now, like, can you just briefly talk about that? I can. I've seen it uh, improve uh, so much over the years that I've been involved in aviation. The airplanes are more reliable. Uh, what they can do on their own is amazing. What they can uh, information they can present to the pilot through 
uh, glass cockpits and heads-up displays are so much better and should make uh, the Navy pilot a, uh, a better weapon system and also a safer weapon system. I don't know the statistics in the Navy anymore, so I don't know if that's true. But I'm very envious about these guys flying these F-18s, F-A-18s, uh, off carriers over in the Arabian Gulf or wherever they might be. Uh, I've thought many, many times about uh, if I had all this to do over again, if, or if I was a young man again, what would I do? And I, I believe that if I were a young man, that I would join the Navy, go to flight training, go try to be an F-A-18 pilot, go over there and serve and uh, do those amazing missions they do now, much more than we could do uh, earlier on because the airplanes didn't have the capability that they do now. So I think it's a more demanding job, but still it's got to have the same good feelings when, when people do it. The Navy obviously had a huge impact on you and the training that it provided helped bring you to NASA. Um, what are some, what's some of the aspects that the Navy has helped you with when you got to NASA? Well, I think one of them that was turned out to be very important, only I didn't realize it at the time. In fact, while I was in the Navy, it seemed a little frustrating. In the Navy, you're a Naval officer first and a pilot second. So when you go to a squadron, you're maybe the maintenance officer and you're expected to be a pilot too. In the Air Force, it's not quite like that. When you go to a squadron, you're the pilot, and they have another guy over here that's maintenance officer, which is good, and I, that's, you envy that when you're a young pilot. But I think having it the other way around uh, somehow makes your point of view about military service a little bit different than some of these other services. In NASA, uh, on the Apollo program, most of the commanders were naval officers, even though our boss, Deke Slayton, was an Air Force officer. And he tried to pick the best people to do the job. And so what I read into that was he believes these naval officers, if you just mix them all up, somehow they'll make better commanders in Apollo. And I think that's how he felt. And, and so I think that maybe, maybe the Navy way is a better way. I don't know, because I, believe me, I, I've met Air Force pilots, and Marine pilots, and Army pilots that just as good as I am or better. So it's not like the Navy is gonna make you better, but this attitude about being a Naval officer and also a pilot, I think it has a, uh, an effect on maturing you and making you see your job differently. Um, how were some of the similarities, or what were some of the similarities and differences when in between a flight squadron and the astronaut corps? Well, there's one big difference that uh, I didn't catch on to quick. I thought of uh, NASA, all astronauts, is sort of like being in a squadron, we were all there together being, being as good as we can be. But that isn't true. And there, there, everybody was trying to be as good as they could be, but the smart ones were able to say, well, this is a competition too. So I better find a way to be good and also make sure my boss, Deke Slayton and Al Shepard, know it. Because if they don't know it, then they're not gonna pick me and I want them to pick me instead of those other guys over there. And so uh, that was a big difference. I consider that the biggest difference when I got to NASA. Uh, first of all, I didn't catch on for several years that this was going on. Uh, and uh, and uh, then when I did catch on to it, I, I didn't like it. I, didn't li I don't like to live my life that way. And so uh, I had to for a while in order to compete. But when I finished my NASA career, I became an artist. You don't, you put out a painting. If people like them, they buy them. If they don't like them, they don't. 
and if I'm not competing with other artists or anything else. I'm doing the best I can do. So that's my personality. I had to adjust it at NASA. Now, on Apollo 12, B. Conrad was your commander. Yes. And then before that, he was also your instructor at Pax River. Absolutely. How different was the relationship between when he was your instructor to not really when he was your boss, but a coworker and a shipmate on Apollo 12? Well, uh, you, you don't get to know each other so well when one is the instructor in a classroom with 25 students. And then when you get on a crew, there's only three of you. So you get to know each other really well. But one of the things that occurred at NASA that I observed was that people uh, picked people to fly with them that they knew or they knew of. So Air Force guys tended to know other Air Force people. And so when they would form a, squad, a, a flight crew, Air Force pilot Jim McDivitt, let's take Apollo 9, Jim McDivitt, he thinks, wow. And then he says, you know, uh, I know uh, Dave Scott. He, he was a really great pilot at the test pilot. I'll ask him to come along. Rusty Schweikert was a civilian, but he had been in the Air Force. So they kind of know. And so one of the things that was very lucky for me is Pete Conrad, when he forms a crew, then he picks Dick Gordon, who he was a squadron mate with. And then he picks a guy named C.C. Williams, who's a Marine that he knew. And C.C. gets killed. And so then he picks me and the three of us go off together. So. It's not that you don't like the Air Force guys or think they're as good, you just don't know them as well. And also like I, I, I don't need to add that, I'll say it now, but the culture is different. And so I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. You can do it the other way, but I think the other uh, seems to work better. And uh, Gene Cernan, uh, flew with uh, uh, Tom Stafford in Germany. Tom Stafford was a graduate of the, Air, uh, uh, the Naval Academy. And then when he flew on 17th, okay. anyway, uh, I've said enough on that subject. So it, it, uh, it isn't you can't do it the other way. It seems more like it it's more comfortable and you know those guys better. You've known them. Pete knew me for 10 years or five years before I ever showed up. And then we were off doing different things, but he still knew me where he didn't know maybe Dave Scott so well. Now, when you actually got on to the moon on Apollo 12, is there anything, any amount of training that the Navy or NASA or anybody can give you for what you're about to experience as you take the steps off that ladder. Oh, yes. I think the uh, NASA, uh, the way you try to train somebody is the Navy way and Air Force and others. You try to anticipate what skills they're going to need. And so you teach them those skills in simulators or something. And then you try to anticipate the unusual environment they'll be in using those skills. And then they try, you try to simulate that too. And that's what we did. And so the same way the Navy treats, teaches you to be an airplane pilot, then NASA treats, teaches you to be a spaceship pilot. And then the same way I guess the Marines teach a fella to get on the ground and, and be a good infantryman or a tank commander or something, then they teach you that part of it. It's geology, you don't have a tank or a rifle, but the same things apply. So the training is, is just the same, and the principles are just the same. And so it, it's, uh, I feel blessed all the time. I have spent, the military spent so much time, and NASA spent so much time teaching me things 
and so that I could do my job better. It, it's been wonderful. It's every human, every human, male and female, if they were look smart, would join the military, even if they didn't want to be in the military for more than two or three years, and it would start them on their path to professionalism in a way that would mean a lot. Now, other people can overcome it, but this way everybody would have a, a, a better head start. I thank my lucky stars all the time that I accidentally was fortunate enough to start in the Navy and have the Navy teach me these things. They expect you to be on time. They expect you to tell the truth. They don't expect you to sell this product to some guy that doesn't need it. They expect you to tell the truth. They expect you to be reliable. They expect you to get along with other people that maybe you like or don't like for the good of the military. The military teaches you to be a patriot and an American. A lot of people think they're Americans and they're not. Most of the congressmen and senators up there, you don't need to put this in there, they need to rip that American flag off their lapel and put their own damn picture on there or a picture of a donkey or, a, or an elephant because they're not patriots to this country. They are self-serving guys. And the Navy teaches you how not to be. Now, you may turn out to be very self-serving later, but you've got some people that show you the way to be a good patriot and a good American. I think the number one patriots of this country are the guys over there fighting in Iraq and those other places. So I know a lot of people just think they're crazy to be over there, but they're serving their country, they're patriot, they are Americans. It's like you two guys. Okay? Um, is, is there a specific instance while on Apollo 12 or in Skylab where your military training came back and just paid dividends? I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, don't forget NASA is a paramilitary para, uh, organization. So even though it isn't quite as structured and you don't wear uh, uniforms, it runs sort of that way. And uh, so how to relate to senior officers, junior officers, it's not as rigid as the military. Um, I think that's better. I think it's better when uh, you have a structure that uh, is flexible and and everybody in the system is flexible. They know who the final authority is, but the give and take is not so um, regimented. Where people can argue with, I could argue with Pete and say anything I wanted to him, and it didn't have anything to do with the struct command structure because he knew if he said to me, I've heard it, Al, I want you to go do it anyway, I'd go do it anyway. You know what I mean? But I could holler at him as I left, this is a dumb idea, but I'm going to go do it. But I think that's better than some uh, rigid military policies because everybody has good ideas and two heads are better than one, three heads are better than two or one, and that way you get the best uh, from every single person. You can't always get that in the uh, in uh, the military because people down at the bottom are afraid to go up and, and uh, do it. One other thing that I think is different about military leadership that's uh, important, and I believe maybe it's changed, needs to be changed. In the military leadership uh, books and the thing that you talk about, the leadership comes from there down to here. Uh, I believe that that's good, but it needs a lot of feedback. And not only that, an individual, if you read leadership books that I read in those days, they taught you uh, how to uh, lead the people below you. 
I think an equally important thing they don't talk about in the military is you need to learn to lead the people above you because they need leadership too by people that are down here in the trenches or know this part of the job better than they do. But they don't teach you how to do that. I had to learn that at NASA. I had to learn how to tell my bosses, you know, that's a good idea, but here's, here's the way I see it. From here, it looks like maybe it's not as good. So, and be able to do it in a way that doesn't offend them. And maybe they would say, you know, I think I'm going to change. Because, like I say, people below me have given me a lot of good ideas. I flew as commander of a Skylab mission. And uh, I, it, would have, it was a great mission, but it wouldn't have been near as great without the fellows that were below me keeping me straight and saying, Al, I don't think that's a good idea. Maybe if we did this, or, or uh, I think if we don't want to do that, we want to do this. I always listened to them, and it did, I didn't have my ego invested in a way where I said, well, I'm the commander, we're going to do it the way I said first. It was always for me, well, that's a better idea than I thought of. Let's do that. Let's try it anyway and see if it works. So you don't learn that, and I don't know if they teach it now, but learning to lead upward is very important. And do they teach you that now? Yes, sir. Good. See, it's something they didn't do in my day. Every leadership book I read, and I probably read them all in the Navy that they had, I don't remember ever reading that. But, you know, I wasn't tuned to it, maybe. Yes. Yeah. We're just going to swap out this just for 